We are in interesting times as far as Marvel and DC comics. We can see them both courting harder and harder every single month, the speculator crowd. And with the amount of ratio variant covers and comic book reboots that we're getting, that it feels like the speculator audience is actually driving comics at this point to a degree. And here to talk with me about that is a man that not only writes comic books, Aaron Sparrow, but he's also orders it and does some work for comic shops as well. Is this something that you've noticed as a trend within the comic shops that you've been ordering for and working for? Well, most of the comic shops that I order for uh, no longer carry comics. So uh, they, they got out uh, earlier this year, uh, finally said enough is enough, looked at the numbers, looked at the amount of real estate that it was taking up and decided that it wasn't worth it. Uh, and a lot of that was because there aren't many readers anymore. Uh, part of the reason that Marvel and DC have to lean so heavily into speculators is because they don't know how to attract readers. They only know how to drive them off. So the only way to keep their numbers high enough to justify their jobs to their corporate masters is to make it look like the comics are really successful. We've sold a lot of copies, but really you've sold a lot of copies based on retailers trying to get one cover to sell to a customer at an inflated price that hopefully covers all of the uh, cost of the issues they had to order to get it that they'll never be able to sell. Yeah, so we've even seen the indie scene do it even better than Marvel and DC, specifically with Boom when they had Berserker number one. Keanu Reeves had a special, I think a one in, in 1,000 variant that he signed that was autographed specifically from him. That drew, drove a lot of orders. And then with Spawn, or is it King Spawn number one from Todd McFarlane, where he had the the one in two fifty autographed comic book that was that was overseen by CGC and that really drove up the sales, obviously courting the speculator audience as well. You know, I'm sure that those King Spawns are still sitting in the you know in the comic stores. It's uh, it's kind of one of those things where it's like you have to you have to decide as a retailer, is this one cover what I'm going to be able to sell this for? Is it going to be worth it? And in the you know the case of the lower ratio variants, like you know your one in twenty fives, your uh, even your one in fifties, it's not often worth it. But, you know, when you do get those special things like, you know, Todd McFarlane or Keanu Reeves, who are legitimately uh, superstars in their own rights, uh, them actually autographing it, you know, you, you dri that drives people to, uh, to pay more. So comic shops can make a little, bit mon a little bit of money that way. Unfortunately, that's not sustainable and it's not a long-term strategy, but the comic book industry has always proven to be pretty poor at having any kind of long-term strategy for its own health. Well, it's become kind of a long-term strategy. You know, it started out with a 1 in 10 variant, then a 1 in 25, then a 1 in 50, then a 1 in 100, then a 1 in 250, and now we're, you know, we're up to 1 in 1,000 and stuff like that, where they're really having to, to put out these special covers to make the, the illusion that this, this cover could be worth something in, in the future and that retailers can absolutely sell it for a lot of money. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of like a play-to-pay strategy. It's like playing a mobile game. Uh, you know, there's going to be the whales that are going to uh, spend real money on virtual items and are going to uh, put money in the pockets of the developers. And then there's, you know, the free to play players that are going to be, uh, you know, just, they're not going to spend a dime. They're just going to grind their way through the game. That's kind of the way that the comic market seems to be looking at everything is, you know, they seem to be aiming towards the whales. But I don't know how many whales are left. And as comics continue to become more and more niche and less and have less and less appeal, I don't know how long this is sustainable. Well, it feels like they're almost selling it less on entertainment, more of an investment, or even almost like pseudo gambling, where you're, where you're throwing some money out there with the opportunity potentially to be worth a lot more in the future. Do you think that the speculator audience that they're courting so heavily can actually keep DC and Marvel kind of above water for any type of long period of time? Obviously, they tried it once and it didn't work, and they're really going in on it again. It must have some type of value to the publishers if they're doing it and the retailers to kind of go along with it. But there has to be like a, a point of of uh, limited returns where it no longer works anymore. Well, you're kind of starting to see that. Uh, you're seeing less and less of uh, like J. Scott Campbell covers uh, moving the way that they did just because they're, they're kind of so oversaturated. And, uh, you know, J. Scott, he'll do a cover, but he'll draw, you know, he'll draw your character. There she is leaning up against something, smiling, uh, you know, looking sexy, but there's no background. You know, it's like very basic. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of that stuff that's oversaturating the market. So I think we're tr starting to see that strategy work less and less, which, of course, has always been the case. But unfortunately, the comic industry doesn't have any new ideas. They just go back to the well and they milk something for as long as they can until it completely fails. Um, and then they move on to the next old idea that hopefully seems fresh and new for a few months, you know, a few years. 
it's uh, it's really unfortunate uh, because uh, you know my, in my mind the way to sell comics is to tell good stories that people are interested in and offer them at a reasonable price. The industry doesn't seem to know how to do that anymore. So we, here we are in just the speculator market. Well, it's interesting that you bring up J. Scott Campbell. He has his own website where he'll pay Marvel so he can make his own covers for their comic books. And he'll have a whole set of like 10 different covers for a number one issue that he'll sell exclusively on his website. And I think you're right. That ends up, uh, you know, it becomes less unique when Marvel does it themselves, when you can go directly to J. Scott Campbell and you kind of have better covers there anyway. Yeah, you know, he, obviously he's going to put more effort into the ones that he's selling under his own brand name than he is, uh, you know, just, just going to appear on a Marvel book and uh, get sold in regular stores. You know, he wants to drive you to his site. He wants to drive you to his brand. I think that's smart because, you know, I think J. Scott realizes, uh, as many artists have, that, uh, you know, the industry is hitting a point where it's it's not going to be sustainable for a lot of people. And there's going to be a lot of a uh, lot less opportunities. So, you know, if you can branch out and you can do your own thing and you can build your own brand, that's that's what you need to be doing, whether it's uh, something like J. Scott Campbell's doing or whether it's through crowdfunding. And we're certainly seeing DC kind of following the the older Marvel, Marvel trend, which is still going on to this day, where we're seeing a, a definite uptick in number one issues, which I, I believe they consider to be a jumping on point to be a pseudo collectible, really. You know, it's a number one issue. This is this is going to be important. But as you continue delivering them and they don't deliver on any promise and really it doesn't set up a whole lot of interesting things. And then the series just gets rebooted back to a number one issue within the next 24 months anyway. It kind of loses that mystique and that that inherent value when you look at it. It no longer kind of draws your eye or your attention because there's so many number ones, number one issues for that character. But just for comics in general, you used to have really long runs, which uh, I think is uh was more beneficial to comics in general. You know, when I jumped into comics, I, I was jumping into issues like, you know, buying X-Men in the 200s and things like that. And that's what made me seek out comic shops to get back issues. Of course, in those days, you didn't have digital. You couldn't uh, find things that way. Um, so, yeah, if you wanted to read those old stories, you either had to hope that they printed a trade that you could pick up or you had to uh, you had to go on the hunt. And I think that drove the collector mentality. I think that like so many things nowadays, uh, this new collector mentality is just lazy. This, you know, rebooting in a new number one. It's like, oh, I'll collect that new number one. I'll collect the next new number one. But they're not building any kind of long-term readership or any kind of long-term interest. Like, I, I don't give a crap about new number ones anymore because I know that book's going to be shut down in eight issues and they're just going to reboot it with another number one. And then pretty soon you're going to be looking through your collection. You're going to be like, okay, wait a minute. This is, what is this? This is Harley Quinn volume 16, number one, volume 17, number one, you know, it's just, I don't care. It's just, you've, you've cut the continuity. You've cut the, uh, the things that made comics exciting to, uh, to a lot of the uh, collectors. And, you know, now you're just, you're appealing to a very small market that has already proven to be fickle in the past. As soon as they realize they're not going to be able to, uh, you know, sell these things for as much as they were hoping, uh, they're going to go away and they're going to go look for something else. I mean, there's so many better things you can spend your money on. You could be buying sneakers if you want to flip them. Uh, you know, that's a much more lucrative market. Uh, you could be uh, you could be NFTs. You could be investing in the stock market. There's all kinds of better places to spend your money. And uh, comics kind of benefits from the fact that people love comics or they love the idea of comics, even if they don't read them. And they love that idea of an, of an investment. And, you know, something I'm going to be able to flip. And it's also something cool that I've got, you know, in the meantime. But that ends. That ends when people can't flip it for what they thought they were going to get. And they realize, man, these things take up a lot of room, don't they? Well, and also you think about like Marvel Comics with Captain Marvel. I think there were 13 number one issues in like a 10 year span. Talk about killing the the idea or the aura that a number one issue is important or just recently or, or it hasn't quite happened yet. But they're essentially rebooting Daredevil back to a number one issue with the same writer and artist. And yeah, it's nothing... the same plot line that they were doing before. It was like, what's the number one for yeah, so that they can, you know, put 18 covers on it and make it feel, you know, nobody's going to buy into 18 covers on a number 33. You know, that's not going to, that's not going to fly. But on number one, you know, you can do a bunch of stupid variant covers. I look through the, uh, the FOC every Monday on Diamond, and I just look at all of these number ones, and here's this cover, and here's that cover. And half the time, they don't even have the cover available for you to see. It's mm -hmm. it's final order cutoff, and Diamond doesn't have a picture of it. So if you want to know what it looks like, you got to hope that you know Marvel has it up. You can go on the uh, go on the internet and search it uh, search it up. But Diamond doesn't update any of that. So it's like, 
it's just it's ridiculous they, they're putting out all these covers and they're not even done at the time that they give them to diamond it, it's just a big scam it's just the the worst version of a cash grab that you can find in comic books nowadays is this weird cover scam that they they're just making bigger and bigger bigger it's almost like a ponzi scheme at this point well that's mark brooks whole career isn't it it's just uh you know characters standing around vaguely staring in different directions with blank expressions and they all look sort of damp like that's that's basically you know uh, every time there's a new x-men event you're going to get that cover from uh from mark brooks so you know there apparently is a uh, you, you can't have a, a career based on it um but yeah it's uh it, it's called banking covers it's like we're going to need so many covers for this thing and it's not finalized yet so just uh have uh, have somebody draw one of spider-man swinging have uh, somebody do a mary jane cover I don't, I don't know what she's doing but just, just put mary jane on a cover with spider-man the artist will figure it out doesn't matter if it has anything to do with the book you know so that you can bank all of that stuff and have it all ready for uh for when you have your next number one which is coming right behind the number one that you're working on now it, the Mark Brooks covers always kind of make me laugh. It's like, uh, you know, when you look at those pictures of families from like the 1600s or 1500s, you're like, man, they must have had to stand still for a long time to paint that. It's like, <laughs> but it must have been real boring. It's like those X-Men must have been having the most boring day of their lives when Mark Brooks was deciding what that cover was going to look like because they're just sitting there. I'll tell you what Marvel's next variant cover scheme should be. It should be Mark Brooks painting... Uh, the characters like those jc penny's portraits when you were a kid <laughs> where it's just a shot of the face looking directly at the reader and then the you know in the upper corner there's the profile yeah. shot just do that yeah. and do it <laughs> do it all with those... the mark brooks glamour shots marvel <laughs> book you know what i mean remember when your grandma used to go to glamour shots and she'd come back she'd look like uh, some type of southern bell or something when you were a kid yeah you'd be like because that's what i want to think about is sexy grandma do, yeah do that do that that, that do it marvel cowards that thing would be great because we do have this upcoming i saw one of these stupid stupid covers i guess it's for iron man and hellcat go to hell or something i, I think that might be the name of the one shot and of course it's iron man and hellcat as cats who who's, who does that appeal to cat ladies i don't know man <laughs> it's like not me it's like it's so stupid all the cat ladies work at marvel they don't buy marvel well you, you might be right there but <laughs> you know it's just I'll tell you what, Tony Stark has already gone to hell because he's being written by Christopher Cantwell. Yeah, Christopher Cantwell well is going to be the death sentence for Obi-Wan as well. It's just it's frustrating because you see what the influence that the speculators have had on the, the industry. And somehow DC and Marvel have prioritized speculators that are coming in there, not reading the comic book. And a sale is a sale. I'm not going to say that. But they've done it at the expense of actual readers. And they have to keep and court the speculators harder and harder to where they get to a point where if they just leave the whole thing is going to collapse like a house of cards well when you've determined that the message you know your activism is more important than uh telling entertaining stories and having readers stick around the only way that you can and you've decided that is the most important thing but you still have to hit certain sales goals this is the only direction you can go in you have to have people, you know, putting money down for this just absolute trash that nobody wants to read, um, but still coming in and buying, you know, still coming in and buying it every month. So you can say, oh, look at how many sales we had. We sold 250, you know, uh, more copies of this one, you know, because of this variant cover. That's all money towards the bottom line. So, uh, you know, yeah, until there's actually an editor in chief or a uh, managing editor that uh, comes into place at Marvel that actually is like, hey, you know what? We need to return to the days of telling compelling stories about heroism and uh, leave all of this uh, political posturing at the door. You're not going to see the readership. Uh, you're not going to see the readership improve. So you're going to have to keep relying on these ridiculous uh, Ponzi schemes. In the beginning of 2021, I actually had a more in-depth conversation about speculators, whether they're good or bad for comic books. I actually had a, my good friend Eric Breed with me. Definitely check this out. It's an oldie but goodie. And there's a good chance that I have a really stupid haircut but Breed is going to make a lot of really good points. That's what you should be coming for.